thankful for the, the fine weather that uh, we're experiencing right now. And we covet the, the rain that we're getting, especially at this time of year when it's normally so warm and so hot. We thank you, Father, for the effort that Lanny puts into these classes, and we're looking forward to another lesson from the book of James. Watch over him and bless him as he uh, delivers this message, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, well, old school. we're going old school. Have you all, do you remember what this is? You want to get out your cell phones if you, if you have your Bible on your cell phone or if you, or if you have your, uh, have a piece of uh, hardware with you, whatever we call these things, books. Um, I have some really good stuff on the uh, slide show, um, but it, what we do, we, we, we use Dropbox, and I put it into a folder from my home computer, uh, and it just didn't make the trip this time, and we didn't discover it until just now. So we'll have it next week. It's still safe on my hard drive at home, but I don't have time to go home and get it. So... Uh, but I've got some good music on it, and we're not going to bypass it. We're going to come back to it because I put a lot of work into, into that for you and got some really interesting stuff. But today we're going to go old school, and we're going to open the Scripture. And, you know, if you're, if you're not a believer in God or in the... Christian scripture as the word of God, well then, you know, you're not bothered by these things the way that those of us are who believe that this truly is the divine word of God. And there are a lot of scripture that are very challenging and a lot of scripture is challenging for people who are coming to faith. And then there's James. And within James, there's James chapter 2, which is perhaps one of the most challenging, most difficult for those of us who are maturing in the faith. Not, not people who are still working with the milk of the gospel, but who are trying to the very best of our ability to become more and more in the image of Jesus. And there are, are things that we run into, and I'm speaking for myself, and I think I can speak for all of us, which are bigger hurdles than others to get over. And James just hits a smack in the face with it in chapter 2. And being James is nothing but blunt. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. So we're going to go through it a little bit, and then we're going to come back and, and revisit it again next week with the slides because uh, it's worthy of emphasis and is worthy of repetition. So chapter 2, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim that you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know of anybody who is writing scripture who uses that specific terminology, glorious Lord Jesus Christ. That's the fourfold, uh, the fourfold exclamation of his opinion now of his half brother, the one that he was not a believer in their growing up. So he's come a long way from the days of his childhood, hasn't he? How can you claim that you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor 
some people more than others. Oh boy. We're already in trouble, aren't we? Wow. For instance, suppose someone comes into your meeting, comes into church, as we say now, dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in shabby clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that you are guided by wrong motives? Discrimination, preference, prejudice, What does that look like? He's going to be talking a lot in this context as he speaks to the scattered Messianic Jews, Jesus believing Jews. He's going to be speaking in context, in the context of the rich and the poor. We talked about that last week who's rich and who's poor? And we determined that yes, we are rich and yes, we are poor, depending on what we compare ourselves with. But I think that the lessons that he's bringing to our attention are much, much broader and much, much deeper than that. This is the tip of the iceberg, and uh, this is the uh, this is the kind of the uh, the entry point into a much, much deeper consideration. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom and promise the kingdom promise to them who love him? And yet you insult the poor man. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it is good when you truly obey God's royal command, and we'll talk about royal command in a little bit, found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself, but if you pay special attention to the rich, you are committing a sin for, your, for you are guilty of breaking that law. What law? The royal law of Christ. And the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you murder someone, you have broken the entire law even if you do not commit adultery. So whenever, what, so whenever, you're speak, whenever you speak or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law of love, the law that set you free. For there will be no mercy for you if you have not been merciful to others. But if you have been merciful, then God's mercy toward you will win out over his judgment against you. Mercy trumps judgment. Isn't that a powerful and wonderful thought? And then he's going to go on and talk about faith and works. But let's talk a little bit about prejudice about prejudging, about preference, preferential care, preferring one over another. 
Is there anyone in here guilty of that? James is talking about rich versus poor. Famous over infamous. So, would we ever show preferential care here? Uh, you, you know, our, our situation is different than James's, I'm sure. There was, there was a lot of, uh, of class distinction among the people of that time. And in many places in the world today, class is, is up front, out front, understood by everybody. Uh, classic example of that is in India, where, where you're born into a caste, and you never get out of that caste. You're there, period. I'm, I'm wondering how the churches in India, and there are a growing number of them, Christian churches, I'm wondering how they are dealing with the caste system. You think that's a challenge for them? You've got a, a group of people here who are just... That it's accepted. If you're born into a low caste, you just accept it. You don't try to get out of it. You're always going to be there. And now you're in a congregation where everybody is brothers and sisters by the blood of Christ. How do you work your way through that? We don't have the caste system that we acknowledge in our culture. But we have a caste system, don't we? Based on financial wealth, based on where we come from. If someone comes in to our assembly for the first time and they're dressed finely and it's obvious that they are well off, Will we respond to them any differently if one of my friends from the mercy tree comes in who's living on a boat or under a bridge or in a car? How many of you know that we've had my friends from the mercy tree here with us? They sit on the back row because they're not comfortable and they exit quietly I see them I know them but I don't see people crowding around them and it's hard in a big congregation isn't it? it's not like it was when we grew up with, with 100 people and somebody come in boy <laughs> everybody's going to be on that in a big congregation we don't know everybody so we don't know who's who's who and who's not But what if Simone Biles came in next Sunday? <laughs> Would we gather around her and ask for an autograph? What's our, what's our astronaut's name, Dick? Um, Victor Glover. First black gentleman to be at the space station. He's, he's, his family's here. Southeast, occasionally. How would we treat him when he comes back in? We'll be gathering around him to get an autograph. Do we show partiality? Do we show favoritism? Of course, we could talk about uh, the you know the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, of course, is. The, the skin color. Uh, how, how do you feel about skin color? Uh, hopefully that's not an issue with any of us. But it certainly has been, hasn't it? The, uh, the Church of Christ was very much segregated during the, the Civil War era. And I think in many places and in many ways, it continues to be. I pray that that's not ever the case at Southeast. But we have 
we have a culture to overcome to get to that point. I uh, remember attending uh, a meeting with Marshall Keeble. How many of you know Marshall Keeble? My, one of the premier Church of Christ preachers that we've ever had in our brotherhood. Don't tell him how many people he's baptized. He's black. Back in my youth. In Oklahoma. I went to his meeting and enjoyed it, loved it. But it was under a brush arbor. You know what a brush arbor is? It's a, it's, it's like a tent without canvas. It's, you make it out of brush, sticks and stones. Not stones, but sticks. You know why it was under a brush arbor? Marshall Keeble wasn't welcome in our buildings. That hadn't been all that long ago. I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma called Stigler. Not very long before I was born, there was a big billboard at the edge of town. It said, welcome to Stigler. Black man, don't let the sun go down on your head. And we got a church of Christ there that I grew up in. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to um, ask before I approach the throne of the microphone, uh, doesn't have much to do with your lesson in a way, but Marshall Keeble, one of the reasons as I recall that these meetings were held in tents was because of the size of the crowd. Our buildings in, most of them weren't large enough to house a number of people that come to, to listen to them. And that's all, I'm finished. <laughs> that, that's a noble thought, and I, I, I wish that that were true. And I think in some cases it may have been, but, but the little brush arbor I went to could easily have fit in our building. But they did draw a big crowd many times. But this is rural Oklahoma. I never saw a man lead singing like the guy he had with him lead singing. Talk about inspiring. I loved it. I grew up in a, in a school that was, t to say the least, uh, well, there were Indians, Native Americans. I think there may have been, in, in my four years of high school, there may have been one black student in the school. Uh, I lived across the street from a uh, full-blooded Choctaw family, Grand, grandparents and a, a single mother and, and three children and went to school with the children. And, uh, I wouldn't say that there wasn't discrimination, but it wasn't the kind of discrimination that, that our black brethren had to endure. But, uh, where did we ever where did we ever get off on skin coloring being anything more than pigmentation? But it's been as old as humanity, hasn't it? How sad. What other ways do we discriminate? What other ways do we prejudge? Prejudice is to, to have our, our feelings and our thoughts and our judgments of somebody and our actions towards somebody determined by something other than the quality of the person himself. Do we want to be really bold this morning and, and talk about politics? Do you prejudge people? Are you prejudiced against people because of their politics? My dad and mom were not 
that I can remember or know were, were not in, involved in, in politics at all. I never heard them talk about it at home. I couldn't tell you today if they were Democrat or Republican. They voted, but I don't know how they voted, to tell you the truth. It just wasn't a big issue in my... I can remember one time, though, when there was a... You know, you knew who was running for office because they showed up in church on Sunday morning. One time. It didn't make all the churches. Did you, did you ever witness that, David? <laughs> so this guy came into to our congregation one time. He was running for sheriff, county sheriff, in a little Haskell County where I grew up. And uh, after services, somebody was, one of the members was talking to dad and said, you know, Charlie, you need to vote for that guy. He is a really good guy. And I can remember dad saying, well, if he's a really good guy, I don't want to vote for him because if he gets elected, <laughs> he won't be a good guy anymore. That was kind of his take on politics. How do you feel about people who don't agree with you politically? And you know our country is more divided, I guess, than it's ever been since the Civil War, seemingly. And we have people in this congregation who are very strong on, on all seven sides of the issues. I remember when Donna and I lived over in, in Nederland. Nederland, if you, don't re, if you don't know, is a suburb between Port Arthur and Beaumont. But one of my uh, good friends there, my fishing buddy, and he was a deacon there in the church where we were. He's now dead. But uh, he was a Democrat. And he, he, if you looked up Died in the Wool Democrat, you'd see his picture. He was a, a, a union man at, at uh, Chevron, Gulf Oil then. And uh, I, I guess all good union men at Chevron were Democrats. I don't know. It seemed like it. But one time I asked him, I said, Max, if, if Satan was running on the Democratic ticket, would you vote for him? And he thought about it for quite a while. <laughs> too long <laughs> and he finally said all I know for sure is I wouldn't vote for the Republican <laughs> but I loved him anyway <laughs> but it's an issue and you know how James describes all of that whether it's race or riches or nationality or political office he calls it sin he calls it sin how dare he surely it's not that bad if we're going to do everything within our power to grow into the image of Jesus Christ, how much prejudice can we have in our lives? Zero. We've got to grow beyond that. Whatever the preconceived circumstance might be, James says it's sin. You've got to grow beyond it is that easy no not easy but very very important I've mentioned uh, a few times that there, some of us are watching the uh, the chosen series that's being uh, developed now we're into we've had one whole season of eight episodes and we're, we finished the sixth, sixth one, Tom, the sixth one this past week of the second series. I don't know how many there are going to be, maybe five or six. But the thing I love about it so much is that it's a movie about Jesus and the life of Jesus. But unlike any others that I've ever seen put together, uh, it's really developing the characters of the people that Jesus is interacting 
with. Putting flesh and blood on them and thereby really highlighting and bringing to life the flesh and blood nature of Jesus. Do you think that there was a little bit of prejudice in that first century in the Jewish community against Matthew? Matthew is a Jew. He is sold out to the Roman government as a tax collector. Number one, he's collecting taxes for the enemy. Number two, he's getting rich at it because that's what tax collectors did. They collected more than the government required and everything that they could get above what the government required, they kept for themselves. And they were notoriously rich. And Jesus calls Matthew in to his inner circle. And there beside him is none other than Simon the Zealot. Do you know what a zealot is in first century? A zealot is a ninja warrior who lives and dies to make war against Rome. What do you think he thought about Matthew? I just, I'm really enjoying the way that, that the writers and the actors, and they do a really good job of production also, but the way that they're developing these characters and really showing that conflict and how Jesus stands in the middle of it, above it all, mediates it, mitigates it, and pulls them together. And that's what he wants to do for us. Do you think he cares if you're a Democrat or Republican? Do you think he cares if you're black or white? Do you think he cares if you're Hispanic or Native American? Do you think he cares if you're rich or poor? Now, James is using rich and poor here with a very broad stroke, as we've already talked about. But Jesus didn't differentiate between the two. He didn't, he didn't, he was not prejudiced against the rich. He said it's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than for a, I mean, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go into heaven. But it wasn't because he had anything against the rich man. He's just saying, you know, your riches are blinding you. They're in your way. They're going to make it harder for you. But he was a friend of Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was on the, Sanhedrin. He was a friend of Matthew. Matthew wasn't poor. Prejudice. You say you have faith. How can you say that? How can you even say that? If you're distinguishing between your brothers and sisters. The mic's open if anybody wants to chime in. If anybody wants to rebut or add to or tell a story, you're welcome to do that. This is your best chance because I'm, I'm not driven by slides. <laughs> Here's your chance to jump in. Well, it's a big issue. It's a... Certainly in the headlines every day. And there's the way that the government responds to it. There's the way that our friends and neighbors who are not Christian respond to it. And there's the way that we are called to respond to it. And, and that's the only one that matters for us. And the instructions are really quite simple. Don't do that. Work through it. Get over it. I think for me, probably my, my biggest challenge in all of this is trying not to be 
prejudiced against people who are negative and stand in the way of of people trying to make progress in Christ. I get tired of people who are always against it, always against it. And I have to really work hard not to develop an attitude toward them that's not consistent with what James is talking about. I've never had any problem with the color of the skin. It just, I, I was blessed to grow up in a home where that did not exist. It was never an issue. Rich or poor was never an issue in my world. We were always poor, but it was all right. We weren't prejudiced against other people. But I have a, I have a real problem dealing with, with people who are always against everything. Always have to have their own way about everything. That's difficult for me. I have to work on that. Anybody else want to chime in? You going to let me stand out here and fall on the sword all by myself? Come on, Jim. Lenny, I'm with you. I just I, I don't understand this the, the way the race thing is 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 a, a a national thing right now. I just I don't agree with it. I don't feel like I'm that way. Just like I don't see that in you. But one that perhaps is easier for us to talk about than the race thing because I think the race thing can divide about anybody. And I don't want to be divided. But the strides that this country has made in making women equal to men in pay uh, in the military. Um, uh, women have taken great strides, and I don't see anybody trying to divide us again, men and women. Uh, I think women are almost being forced to do more than maybe some of the women wanted to do, but there's almost every place in our society that women are becoming more active in those places and being accepted. So the difference in men and women is one that used to be a prejudice thing. They couldn't vote at the turn of the 20, at the turn of the 20th century, women couldn't vote. So we're barely 120 years into the time when women can vote. So we've made strides there, just like I think this country has made great strides in bringing racial issues to a less of a boiling point and more of a, and the church needs to lead in that. So that's what we do. Thank you, Jim, and that's there a really good point. <laughs> Um, I didn't mention gender. Gender's not excluded from this. And, and I know that's, that's hard for us. Maybe not, I, I mean, I, Jim's right, you know, the country has made a lot of, a lot of progress in, in recognizing and honoring and unleashing women from bondage. Uh, I know some, this will make some people mad, but they've done a lot better job than the church has. And it, it bothers me as, uh, as a leader in a church who has some measure of responsibility that I'm convicted that we have not allowed our women to use the giftedness that God has given them. And I know that in Churches of Christ, that's a statement that can get you disfellowshipped. But I have studied that scripture, the scriptures from top to bottom. I've listened to debates. I've read books. And I'm more and more convinced that we are just wrong. I'm sorry if that offends you. And I know some who are watching online are offended. But I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe we have taken passages out of context and have been very inconsistent in our interpretations. 
and have drawn conclusions that Jesus would not have ever drawn. And coming back once again to the chosen, I, I know you're tired of me talking about it, but I'm loving the way that it shows Jesus' relationship with the women in his, lives, in his life. You know, Jesus and his disciples were supported by the women. The women traveled with them. They, they paid a lot of the bills. And some of the women sat at Jesus' feet. And do you know what it means to sit at the feet of Jesus? It means to be a disciple. It means to be... It puts them on a, on a par with the, with the other apostles. I'm not calling them an apostle, but to sit at the feet of Jesus is what a rabbi did to call his disciples to train under him. And that's what happened with Jesus and the women. I think we have a long way to go to get over the prejudice that we have held against women, not only in society, but within the Christian community. And I think a lot of places have come a long way with it. And uh, so you can take that for what it's worth. If I'm not here next week, you'll know why. Anything else? We're about to run out of time. And uh, like I say, I've got some good music to go with this. And I've got some slides to go with this. And we're going to go back briefly through this. And then we'll get on into the, uh, to the works part of it. Faith and works. I don't, I don't think we really have any issue with that. I mean, we know that faith without works is dead. I, that's, that's axiomatic. It, just, it doesn't make any sense to say that you can believe in God and not do anything about it. It's a contradiction of terms, isn't it, David? It makes no sense at all. But this prejudice is, is so broad. We, we get focused on, on the, the black-white issue or we get focused on, on some other aspect of it, but it's all of it. And it's always been an issue. It's an issue in the first church, first churches in, in, in Jerusalem. It's an issue in the, uh, you know, I mean, you know, even in, in Jerusalem, just thinking back to, the, to when, when they were trying to do a good deed and take care of the widows, what happened? Well, the Grecian widows, <laughs> these were Jewish widows who had came, come from Greece. They weren't being treated as well as the others, right? That's what got deacons started. Let's get some deacons together and pass the buck. Us apostles are tired of dealing with that mess. It's just wrong. Discrimination is wrong. These people that show up here on Friday to, to get a free meal are just as valuable in God's sight as the bank president who comes into our midst. Anything else? I have gone far afield today, but uh, anyway, had some things on my heart, and happy to happy to have you here to uh, to share them with you. Your brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying you have faith if you don't prove it by your actions? <laughs> that kind of faith can't save anyone. Suppose you see a brother or sister who needs food or clothing and you say, well, goodbye and God bless you. Stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? You know, thinking about prejudice and, and preferential treatment, treating one person better than another. You know, Jesus touched lepers. Jesus healed the beggars. Have you all ever seen a leper? I guess we still have a leper colony over in Louisiana, maybe. I'm not sure. We did the last time I looked. I might have seen one or two lepers in my life. I don't, I don't have much opportunity to touch lepers. But who are our lepers? Who are our lepers today? 
are they the, the homeless under the bridge? Are they the prostitute? Are they the homosexual? Oops, I didn't mean to say that. Who are our lepers? When was the last time you touched a leper? Are they the widows who are struggling to get by on welfare and raise a family? Who are our lepers? Are we prejudiced against them? Are we doing anything to help them? No wonder, no wonder Martin Luther tore James out of his Bible, right? <laughs> All right, we have managed to uh, go through an entire 45 minutes without a single slide. Who would have thought it? <laughs> you were prejudiced, you didn't think I could do it. <laughs> well, I could have used a little bit more help. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for all of you who are online. Have a wonderful, God-blessed week.